baseball games, you could have some other teams too. Uh, we have a nice large group tonight. The topic tonight is the origins of baseball, how it all started out. I could talk about the origins of baseball and just stay on that, and I think I could bore you all to death. A couple of it's interesting, but just to stay on that, I'm going to show you how the origins of baseball tie into the modern baseball today, how they're playing the game tonight, right now downtown, and uh, how little it has changed, but how big those changes really were, and how the game has evolved over time, how it still is evolving, and how it's become worldwide a lot more than it ever has been, how it continues to grow, even though it's no longer in this country's America's pastime, it's the world's pastime behind the soccer, maybe. <laughs> football as they call it the rest of the world. Um, in baseball, we all get our nicknames. You guys heard my nickname, Rufus. Since, you're, I'm, uh, since I'm leading this thing off, and we grab my lineup card here, you see nine lines there. What does that represent? That's my batting That's my lineup. That's, that's my batting order. So since Rufus is starting off, that's me. I'm, we, who else has got a baseball nickname in here? You got a baseball nickname? Yeah, but I'll, I'll make one up. Go ahead. What, you got? What, do you, what is it? L-I-C-H-T-Y. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my list, man. I'm not sure how to keep that spelled up there. Lichty? Yeah. Or, you know, Lichty's Tavern. Over in oh, yeah. L-I-C-H-T-Y. Okay. Any baseball nicknames? What do you got? What's your baseball nickname? What's your football nickname? Soccer nickname. They call you the Flash? They call you the Thunderbolt? Do they call you a Dragger? Hey, the two look, good looking guys in the front, that Slugger and Lefty up there. Right, right there. <laughs> Slugger with the glasses on. We'll put yeah. Lefty back in first. That Lefty with the. Slugger clean, here, clean up hitter. What's this little gentleman right here? What's he got you brought? US 66? Oh, me? Whose baseball number's down in the Reds? Oh, oh. So help him out. Help him out, guys. Sweet. This is this is Fleet sitting in the back seat. We're gonna call. He's a great Reds player. If you don't know who he is, you're bad. Fifth. What's your baseball nickname? S P P A. I heard that one before. S P P A. I'm gonna redshirt you. I heard Scooter. That's a cool baseball nickname. Yeah, that's Scooter Helcher from Reading. Oh, I want the last one here. My pitcher, I want to make the Scotsman. He's got a year. He's got Scottish heritage. We call this him. Right here? Oh. This is my lineup. I'm going to put this up. When did baseball lineup start in baseball? When did baseball start? Absolutely, because the game was started in 1846 in Hoboken, New Jersey. It was the first real baseball game that they played. There's, there's a gentleman that set up a codified set of rules. He said, this is how we're going to play baseball. We're going to set up on this diamond. We're going to try it out like this here. And the first real game with nine players on both sides, playing with the modern set of rules we pretty much know today is a very similar game. Slight few differences. He set that up in 1846. Baseball history in Cincinnati, we're talking about 1869 was the start of baseball history. Why is 1846? If you look at my timeline here, 1869, we're starting here tonight. But I gotta mention a little bit before that because baseball did start in 46. That was the first real game. Up until then we were playing rounders, cricket, bat and ball games, all kinds of different kinds of games. No really sanctified, codified game that was the same that everybody played, that was unified. And, uh, and it, that was the, the, the Hoboken, New Jersey game. So that started here in 46. It became popular in 61 to 65, about 15 years after it started. What happened during those years? Civil War. War. Civil War. How did baseball evolve with the Civil War? Pastime for the troops. It ain't a pastime yet, but it was going to become that. Because the troops, that's what they played, the soldiers that were in the field. They played baseball while they were in camp and they'd march to the next battle and they'd march the next day and the next day. They'd sit up tents and they'd play baseball. And they learned baseball from the other soldiers that were enlisted in the Union Army that were from Massachusetts and New York. A couple of them that were from New Orleans and Louisiana, some were from St. Louis. Baseball existed in, in those places a little bit more than the rest of the country. Places like Ohio and Indiana, Michigan, Pennsylvania hadn't seen baseball yet. And a little bit that they did see, they were so unfamiliar with that it just wasn't popular yet. Nobody did that strange thing that these people are doing. Civil War, they all mixed together. When the war was over, they came back home. And in places like Cincinnati, they brought this game back to baseball. And they played so much of it here that within four <coughs> years, the first all-professional team, so we started it out, now we're popular, and now it's all professional. And from this point on, it's going to become global, and it's going to continue to grow and spread out. 
In 69, when it started, baseball 69, you had to have issues. the same game 15 years earlier, we, we had lineups. Um, when that, we had a, when, when, when baseball game was developed in 46, it was on a diamond. The bases were 90 feet. And it was a, a real simple system. He had 10 players in the field in 1846. We all know there's 10 positions in baseball, right? I'm not throwing anybody off by saying 10 yet, of course. And don't think designated hitter. They did not do that in 1846. So going into 1869, the field looked similar to this. We had a first baseman. We had a second baseman right in the middle. We had a third baseman. Our pitcher at 45 feet rather than 60 feet 6 inches. A catcher down here. We had outfielders. We'll just call him an outfielder right now. We had three of them. We had a short fielder that played right here. On the left side, we had a short fielder played here on the right side. We had 10 positions to start off. The game was played till 21 aces crossed into the dish. The dish is home plate. So when 21 runs were scored, the game was over. So if a really good team was batting explosively, they could score 21 runs in their top half of the first. And we all know the, the, how, how, how the baseball um, scoreboard looks like. They score 21 runs here in the top of the first, and your team doesn't even bat, the game's over. What if both teams are really, really, really good? So you couldn't get anybody out at home, huh? <laughs> and a game like that, uh, that would have been a terrible team they were playing against. Think about what if the teams are both really good? You know, playing each other, and only one, the away team gets all the way down to here, and they got one run scored. This team here's got two runs scored. How are you going to get to 21 before it gets dark? We don't have lights in 1846. So they changed that rule. Before 1869, that was one of the changes. They went to a 9 in game. It was still without a clock. And still today, baseball does not have a clock. There's a clock involved and a few small things with the game, but the game does not start on a clock, it's not end on a clock. It's a and it's, it's still in that same concept today. So by 1869, we, we're now going nine innings instead of 21 outs, 21 runs. And we're also, by 1869, they have now eliminated this position. And this position here, he can go wherever he likes. The short fielder can move anywhere. Sometimes the short fielder can move over to here. The second baseman can move over to the short field position. But now we have nine players on the field. And it's going to stay like this for another 104 years. We'll get to that point if you can count the longest this, this, this timeline here. So by 1869, we have these players in the field. We have a lineup. We have a scoreboard. How much does this look like modern baseball? <laughs> Very similar. And uh, what's different now in 1869? Some of the bats are different. They didn't have uh, the real thin-handled bats yet. They didn't have, uh, you know, of course, it's all wood. You know, even Major League Baseball today still uses wood, but they're trying other things. Other baseball in the world is still Little League. You guys still use aluminum bats. They're still out there. Um, so the other, but not in 1846, going into 1869. So bats were a little bit different. Some had two handles. Some were a lot longer. Some were real heavy. Some looked like flat on one side. So there was all kinds of different bats. Um, so that's not really the difference. The difference in 1869 is actually how you pitched and how you hit. In 1869, we didn't have gloves yet. Think about that. Baseball with no gloves. How could baseball be played without a glove in the 1860s? Gloves didn't show up until 1878. You know, when I come back to 78, somebody pointed out and said, that's gloves. The, the base, the base we, talk, we pass it around, the ball was a little bit softer. And they tried all kinds of different designs. They tried to make them, they made them dark. They made them light. They made them larger, smaller. They tried different weight sizes. And here you can cross all the way down. In the middle of it, it's got a, got a, got a walnut. Um, so they tried all kinds of different baseballs. And... Um, the different uh, shapes of the way that they stitched them too. This one here is a one-piece design. It looks like a, um, an X on the top. It's very similar to these two. Compared to the, the more modern design, you see the figure eight design. So baseball changed a little bit. The pitching was different. That in the Civil War, these guys had a rag ball that they made. It actually became, by 69, they actually had more of a real ball. And by 67, and we're starting 69, this, this part, the ball was a figure eight design, was very similar to the shape and the size that we had today. A little bit softer. You could actually squeeze a little bit. And a ball would play without gloves. You could play it on a bounce. Some players would, would shy off it a little bit to make a play, to throw it across. Um, there was a lot more hit, playing to, to, for contact. <laughs> pitching was really different, because in 1869, it was pitching underhand. How many times you see baseball pitched underhand? Isn't that softball? But baseball was played underhand up until 84 will come out with. So could they throw it as hard as they wanted though? They absolutely could. When they started off, it was, it was it was completely meant to put it in play for somebody to hit it. They got more creative and in the late 60s and going into the 1870s, 
You're seeing fastball, you're seeing off speed, you're seeing knuckleballs, balls that drop for curves. I mean, they had all kinds of um, pitching styles that had become incorporated, and it pushed it into going to overhand because of so much, there was 46 and 50s, there was so much less of that kind of pitching. But when it took over, they wanted to change it. And in baseball, they realized that it, it wasn't working right, and it, was, it would work better if we could throw overhand, and they had to adjust that for a period of time. But in 1869, the difference is the ball, they pitch underhand, and they pitch for contact. They don't pitch for strikeouts. So let's move on a little bit. 1874, what happens by 1874? How's the game change there? Up until then, when you get a hit, you got to run to first base, you got to stop. In 1874, they let the runner run fast, that pass first. Now think about these when we get to it later. Baseball changes are small, and before it gets to the final picture. It doesn't take too long. As we move along, 1876, what do you think happened in 1876? All these amateur teams are out here playing. There's a professional team from Cincinnati that's on a barnstorm tour. They went across the country. A couple years, they almost went bankrupt, and then they stopped playing ball here and moved to Boston. And 1874 and 1876, there really isn't a professional team here in Cincinnati. But the National League started. That was the first year of the National League. And uh, that was the first year of a league that still exists today. There were some other leagues that started in that time. It didn't, it didn't last until, the days, until, until the, today's time era. But the, the National League was the first professional league that made it until, until the modern era. In 1876, um, it was also the, our country's centennial. It was a 100-year anniversary of the United States of America. And at that time, they started to push patriotic baseball being the pastime and the most popular sport. And it, by then, it had taken over horse racing. Going into 1878, do you remember what happened in 78? Gloves. Gloves. What hand do you put these on? Why do I got two of them? Because you got to wear them on both hands. You need, two, you need two gloves to play baseball in 1878. First guy that claimed the first story of a baseball glove, since it wasn't manly to wear a glove or to protect your hands because the players at that time didn't, the balls are getting a little bit stronger. You get a little bit more firm, <coughs> more fingers being broken because they're not playing with a softer ball like this one here. As the balls get tougher, they're realizing we need to protect ourselves somehow if we can. There was a team, I believe in Connecticut, in the late 1870s. There was a first baseman that had three broken fingers on his hand. His team was shorthanded, and there was nobody else that could play first base that night or that day. He would have played a day game, of course. And when that, he said, I have fabricated a glove. I have made a glove that is so light and leather colored that you can hardly see it when I put it on my hand. What I did was took a work glove, he said. I cut the back of it out. And I took the back of it and stitched it on the front, stuffed some padding, some cotton inside of there. So it's got a little bit of padding when a ball hits it. I cut the fingertips off, he said, so I can have that manual dexterity where I can still wrap my fingers around a ball and be able to throw it accurately from first back to the pitcher or to another base. And I wore, he said, I wore these lighter colored gloves so I could disguise myself a little bit in the field with them. The players laughed at him, made fun of him, called him playing like a girl, and had all kinds of insults that he did, didn't think kindly to. They kept wearing those gloves. And when the players watched him play with those gloves, they saw something different in baseball they never saw before. They watched the shortstop, the short fielder, field the ball, and he'd come up throwing, and he'd rifle the ball to first base. He said that first baseman with no glove, going like his hair, he said, I'm not going to break my hand, or knocking it down and picking it back up, or stepping back and catching a bounce. This guy with his glove, his three broken fingers, he went like his hair. Because he had more protection in his hand, he caught it. The game sped up. Two years later, everybody got gloves, except for Bid McPhee. It was a short time period for the glove transition. The older players, some players were traditional. They didn't want to wear the glove. Some players wore them on both hands. Some players wore them on some one hand. Some players wore them um, just on the throwing hand. So, I mean, it was a, it was, it was a, different, a different way of having those gloves back then as, as they changed a little bit in the very, very early parts of the game. So now, 1870s, we, have, we now have gloves. We, because of the gloves and the harder ball, something else starts to show up. In 1884, anybody remember what happened in 1884? I can go overhand. Because I can go overhand, in the pitching style, they opened it in an all open delivery. You could go sidearm, people were, pitches were still thrown underhand, now they opened up a full overhand delivery. They realized 45 feet was too close. And they took a few years for them to play with that, but they also realized 
I throw the ball harder, overhand, higher in the strike zone, a batter that's hitting, if he tips it off the top of his bat, where's it going to go? Straight back to the catcher, who's not wearing any protection at all. <laughs> now in 1874, 76, going into the 1880s, protection starts to show up the gloves. The catcher started to wear uh, the full, uh, uh, they would make a, a chest protector, much like welders were wearing at that time period. And they fabricated masks, also in welding shops, where they would have one piece of metal going across and a couple to block a baseball from hitting it. And the umpire still wasn't standing right behind home plate yet, so he didn't have the protection yet. That's, he, he's going he's to move over there eventually, and he's not there quite yet. So in 1884, now the game, that was the biggest change in baseball on this whole timeline. That is the biggest change, was going from underhand to overhand. Now the changes are going to be really small and really quick. We're almost done with the changes. Believe it or not, we're almost done with the changes already. Um, going to 18, 1890, you see me in a different color and a little bit bigger. What happened in 1890? The team we know today is the Cincinnati Red started. I believe that's right, 1890? Was it 82? 1882, technically, yeah. And that's the third team, the current Reds team? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the current Reds team is now in existence in 1890. Get away from that point. That's about the last change that we see. In baseball is the same as it is today. And in 1890, now we're at 60 feet 6 inches. Let's put this back. Now the pitcher's at 60 feet 6 inches instead of 45. And, that, and he goes to a mound rather than coming off flat ground. So by 1890, we had the pitcher pitching overhand off a mound, nine positions, nine innings, nine pitches a line. It's the same, and it stays that way till about 2019, which is today. It hasn't changed much since then. A few little changes that are in there, we'll get to them as we go through here, but baseball history, now you see how it started. Where does it go from this point? Now it's professional. They're playing it like we play it today by 1890. That's 130 years ago. Where does it go from there? Going into 1894, everybody know what happened. The significant baseball history that happened in 1895. Come on, come on, man. You any baseball historians? How about just one? Who was born? George or Herman or, or, or Babe Ruth? He was one of the largest figures and legends in baseball history. And they say the new players can look at Babe Ruth's stats. And because baseball, they record everything. There's a stat, a record, a book, a scorecard, a statistic that does this. Baseball, modern baseball players look back at Babe Ruth and say, he was an old man that played in a league that wasn't diverse. And there's, those numbers are, are not really real. because But you look at him, and he's still, numbers are as comparable or better than the top, the top heaviest sluggers in today. So Babe Ruth was, he was as big as they say he was by legend, I think he really was. At the time of the game, he popularized baseball so much by the time he came in. But he's been playing yet. He's born in 1895, 1901. That's the start of the American League, the Junior League, the other league. Now we have two big leagues. What do they want to do? The National League's going to have a champion. The American League's going to have a champion. What are you going to do with those two champions? 1903, we had the first World Series. We've had a World Series every year since then, except for two. There was a strike one year, there was, in the very following year in 04, they couldn't get it together, but they played the series again in 05. Going on a while ago, in 08, what happens in 1908? Who's going to baseball games up until this time period? It's almost all men. Ladies aren't even invited, they're not welcome, and they really don't even want them at a baseball game. Because at a baseball game is a bunch of men that were wearing their work clothes, or shabby suits, smoking cigars, cussing, telling work stories, Gambling on everything that happens, drinking beer, and it wasn't the ladies' environment. So in 1908, as they're selling more tickets and they're building grandstands that are bigger and bigger, baseball owners are realizing we're losing out. There are some women that really like this game that are following it secretly. And there was a song that came out in 1908. It was for the ladies, and it's still around today. It's the most popular baseball song of all time. One, two, three strikes, you're out. Think about the lyrics, take me out the ball game. It's a lady saying, take me out the ball game. She wants to go too. And that's what that song's about. So 1908, now we can bring more women into it. I mean, they're, they're just about allowed to vote. Not quite yet, but almost, almost. Uh, 1910, what? 1908 is also one of the really interesting thing that happened in 1908. I mentioned the Cubs before, and I played that song just before we started. 
That comes because the last time they won a World Series, they didn't win another one in 2016. There are so many interesting stories in baseball. How baseball takes off. It became a sport of the fans more than it became a sport of the players because of how much it meant to the fans. Oh, we watch this game. 1908, they believe the Cubs were cursed all the way through to 2016 because they couldn't win a World Series. You know, over a 100-year period of time. That is a long time. Hopefully the Reds can win another one before they go to 2000 and. 89. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> um, that would be 100 exactly. It was uh, 19, uh, 19, 10, 19, uh, um, 1910. What happens in 1910? It's a very significant baseball history. There was a man that was watching the baseball game very close to the field near the dugout area, which we would call consider a very good seat. And that man was wearing a suit. And he stood up. And everybody's watching him because they're paying this guy was more popular than the game that was going on. And the people are like, wow, what's he doing? Oh, what's he? Oh, he's doing this. Oh, he sat down. Oh, he's what? He's scratching his nose. Who are they watching? Who are they so concerned about? He got up in the seventh inning and stretched. President? Whoa. It was the president of the United States, William Howard Taft. But they paid so much attention to it that they made fun of it for years. We're going to stretch in the seventh inning like Taft did. And it took on. We still do it today. Seventh inning stretch is a very important part of the ball game, especially for the fans. Well, there's no hill on the seventh inning stretch. Was that in Cincinnati? Uh, do you know where that was at, dude? I think it was here, Cleveland, Pennsylvania, Philly. I'm not real sure on that. 1912. What happened in 1912? Now we're starting to see some things happening in baseball that are still here today. We know the game's still played the same way, but it's not played with the same equipment in the same spots with the same players. They're all gone by 1910, I mean, from, from 1840s and 50s and 60s. In 19. What happened in 19? Uh, when did they start allowing stealing? Stealing, they allowed in the 1860s. That was the early part of the game. 1912, there are two baseball structures I can think of that are still here today. One's in Boston, right there across from uh, um, in that street. It's uh, Fenway Park in Boston. I can remember the name of the street. It, it, it's on right there. Yawkey Way. It's right there on Yawkey Way. And a city block in Boston. Another ballpark was built that year, too. And uh, it no longer exists, but it, it has lore in this city. Next, Crossy Field. We didn't call it Crossy Field at that time, but it soon got that name mm -hmm. within the next few decades. But um, then 19, there's a couple other baseball stadiums in 1912, too. Uh, one of them was uh, a Tiger Stadium. And uh, I believe uh, um, the year after, it was another one still around. But some of those ballparks, that was like, now we're starting to see some things that are still here. The modern day, because Fenway Park is still here. And uh, 1912 season was delayed a little bit on opening day. Anybody know why that happened? What was the biggest news story that happened in 1912? Because now we have radio. We didn't have it before. Up until this time period, now it's starting to get out a little bit. Well, we can broadcast and spread baseball even further. The Titanic sunk. They didn't have opening day right away. In 1919, uh, what happened in 1919? Two things. One thing happened in this city. It was a great World Series. The Reds' first victory. Then there was a team from Chicago they called the Black Sox. They all threw out of baseball eventually. But that's not what 1919 is all about in baseball history. That is the single biggest change from 1890 to 2019. In 130 years. I'm holding it in my hand. 1919, 1920. I see a difference. A little bigger. The same size. The stitching's the same, even though they're different colors. They're both white, same design, same weight. This one is as tight as I can make it with my hand, and this one's a machine. This one doesn't compress, doesn't dent, doesn't get lopsided, doesn't get waterlogged as easy. And the game changed in 1920 to 1920. There's a left-hander in New York who hit 54 home runs in 1920. And that was the first time anybody ever hit that amount of home runs. In fact, people didn't even pay attention to a home run. That was a four-base hit. I mean, your big hit was a triple. No one's going to hit a home run. A home run in a ballpark, then they're hitting the ball 500 feet into a place that doesn't even a wall. Makes an outfield just running and running and running. And in this time period here, now they're starting to put fences in. Let's add that to the lineup here. This is happened in 1920. We can call him a left fielder by, by sure, center fielder and a right fielder. All other positions, everything's positions are the same, but now we've got a wall. Now there's home runs being hit. A statistic they're keeping track of in the uh, papers, the newspapers, and, uh, um, and fans of the final games are they're, they're in love with this home run. And the home run is still popular today, even though the home run was not popular all the way up until then. The ball's harder, 
And that's the biggest difference. You know why you can't see it? It's just it's made to be the same. So I mean, the biggest difference in baseball, I'm holding it in my hand, you can't even see the difference. 1921, what happened in 1921? There's a guy from, uh, it was born in Millville, Ohio, just up here in between um, Ross and Oxford. Um, he was a uh, son of a Civil War veteran who was a surgeon that lost his leg at the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain in Tennessee. And he named his son Kennesaw Mountain Landis. That was his name of his son. And Kennesaw Mountain Landis was a uh, very strict man and very stern, and he was a judge and um, stood his ground. Was you know, people said he was, had a, quite a mean attitude, but uh, he threw those guys out of baseball because up until right now, from 1908 to 1919, we're still having a problem with that seedy element that's at the game that's gambling. And uh, the people that are at the game that are the, um, the ones that you, you know, your mother tells you to stay away from, it's, it's those folks. The baseball's still trying to get rid of that. They're still trying to weed out that bad element, get rid of the gambling, and clean it up. And to clean it up completely, they, had, they started, they, they, they said, we're gonna finalize it with the players. We're gonna throw out the, the gambling players. And Kennesaw did that in 1921. In 27, I think by 1927, it was this baseball 1927, was the first thing that comes to your mind. Why is this the here? 1920, the Yankees were the best baseball teams of all time. There was a couple of guys in that team that were Cincinnatians that are buried here in our local cemetery. And the Hall of Famers, Wade Hoyt and uh, Miller Huggins. Um, um, but the 1927 Yankees, Babe Ruth, there was Lou Gehrig. That was, that was the team to model as the best team of all time up until the modern era, up until, the, up, up until we know it today. Um, so that was the, the team that was the best team of all time. 1935, what happens? The owners are once again thinking, we're losing money. We are playing day games. We have access to lights. The Negro Leagues have been using lights for years. Why can't we have it in Major League Baseball? And some cities refused to have lights, but that was the first time we had night games in 1935. That one was here in Cincinnati. They played the Phillies that, that, that day. And then uh, 1942 and 45 is a slash there, those three years period of time, and World War II. <coughs> in World War II, how, what changed in baseball in World War II? One, a lot of players left. Well, there was a lot of, lot of we, 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 there was a there was one team that had a minor league system that was winning all the World Series because nobody else had players. That was the Cardinals. They count all the World Series. Like two of them were from World War II. They should they should really count, but they do. But during World War II, after, after we got bombed at Pearl Harbor and we're at war with the Japanese, patriots and patriotic to they took over again in the United States during that uh, uh, to. Stop to have not having have a draft. They wanted to get enough men to enlist in the army and in the navy and in the, to fight in the armed forces. And in baseball games, they would recognize some of the some of the those in the armed forces, and they started to play the national anthem. And that even though they had played the national anthem at games all the way back until 1869 with live bands, it was never mandatory at a baseball game. And after World War II, it was it was a rule that you had to play the national anthem before it started a baseball game. As baseball changed a little bit here, there's one other color on that list right there. It's green. I got snuck right there in the middle. 1947. What happened in 47? Help us out, Dennis. What happened in 47? Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson wrote a color bear. Now, baseball is uh, that anybody that can play, they're, they're, allowed, they're allowed to play, except for women. They still allow women. Now, 2019 is still allowing a woman to play. I think if she can play, she should be allowed. That's my thoughts. But <laughs> another argument all by itself. But yeah, it's Jackie Robinson. Is in. He's a. Uh, um, brings in uh, African Americans are now playing baseball, along with we already have a few Latinos that are in the game. There are a lot of Cubans that are already in baseball, and we're going to see a lot more of a Latino influence throughout the 60s and the 70s. As we go into 1954, that's not that one, and that's kind of the last of the old era to me before it starts over into more of modern baseball and batting helmets and screens down the lines in the game that I know. But 1954, that was a uh, that was the the catch, the amazing catch in center field that Willie Mays made. It was a ball that was hit in the World Series, and it was hit over the center fielder's head. If anybody remembers watching Billy Hamilton play last year with the Reds, he could turn around, he could outrun a baseball, and he could get there before the ball got there. Well, Willie Mays did that. He runs, turns around, he's running after the ball. He does a catch like this here. He flips over, and he comes back up, and he fires a ball in to keep the guy from running in. Why do we know so much about that play? It was on TV. <laughs> Now TV's involved with baseball. Now we can broadcast it even more. So now it's getting out. But now you can actually see these players that you're reading about in the players in the papers. If you're living in a town like Wichita, in Kansas, and you can't don't have major league baseball. So I mean, it's now it's, it's more and more. Uh, 1961. I had that one highlighted. That was a, one of the most popular years in all of baseball. 
And that was a, a lot to do with television and being able to promote what was going on. What happened in 1961? Roger Maris. It was Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle. They were going after a home run record that Babe Ruth set way back in, in the 20s. And they were going after this record. And both of them were looking like by the end of the season, they were going to be right there ahead, if not past it. And one of them got hurt late in the last month of the season. And Maris went on and he broke that record. And then they put a little asterisk by it by saying it wasn't in the same number of games. And games we went to 144 game season to 162 game season in 1954. He broke his record in 61. He didn't break it enough. And there was all that going on, which all that's been erased now. now. It's in a baseball season. It's in a baseball season. But 61, that caught the attention of the country again. And it solidified this as the best. That America's national pastime. In 73, let's make a change to this board right here. What happened in 1973? I'm going to put a 10th position back on here, like we had way back in the 1840s. Which position do I add in 1973? Designated hitter, because this guy don't hit no more. And it's probably going to be like that throughout all baseball eventually. The National League's probably going to lose their pitchers batting soon. It, it, it seems like it's coming really fast. That happened in 1973, and it's changed our lineup a little bit. Instead of having the pitcher batting down in the lineup, now it's a designated hitter. Still nine spots, though. We just took the picture out. Just could keep the game the same without having to change it. At this point, it'd be too hard to change the game to add that 10th position. Going into 1976, our bicentennial. Now we're 200 years old as a country. What was the other great team that the country recognizes? All over the country. From California to New York, from Minnesota all the way down to Texas. We asked baseball historians, what are the two best teams of all time? 1927 Yankees, 1976 Reds. That big red machine from 75 to 76 they went to the World Series four times. They won two of them, but they went to the World Cup. They were recognized as the best club that was put together perfectly. Now, I don't know if I want to use that term perfect, but they say that because it had speed, it had power, it had pitching, it had the manager that knew what he was doing, and all the pieces in place everywhere, and it was successful. It was a model that worked. How do you say something's perfect? I've only found in my life three things I think that are actually perfect. The game of chess, if you're anybody plays, I cannot find one fault with the game. You know I don't like it. I can't find one fault with the game of chess. The Arabic number system with the zero. It's perfect. I can't find any fault with that. And then baseball. <laughs> I'm a little biased to the third one. The first two, absolutely. But that was the team in the 70s. They said that was perfectly built. And everybody recognized it from St. Louis to everywhere. When in 1985, another... Another big moment may not be on this on this calendar and on this, on this chronological order of events in some other cities, but 1985 was huge in this city on September 11th. That is the day that it did happen on. But on September 11th, in fact, right here of 1985, who had more hits than anybody? The hit king, who's from, from this city, set a record that probably nobody's ever going to break. Pete Rose, that was in 1985. I got an ex going through 1994. That was one of the darkest years of baseball history. What happened there? Strike. That was a strike. We didn't have a World Series in 1994. It started up the next year, and there were so many fans that fell out of love with baseball. And I believe it's at this point in time, in the late 1990s, that baseball has lost its, its, its reputation as America's pastime, and football took over. And uh, at that time, in uh, uh, 1994, the strike would cross that out. 1998, what happened in 98? Kind of the same thing happened in 61. The baseball strike lost a lot of baseball fans. 1998 got a lot of them back. In 1998, there was a guy named Mark McGuire. He was coming up the plate with a big bat. Like, this is a Mark McGuire bat. It says, commemorating the 1998 home run chase. 1961 was 61 home runs. In 1998, there was a guy who hit 70. There's another guy that was going along with him named Sammy Sosa, and they were, they were neck and neck toward the other season, and they were both over 60 you know, by the time it was over. So the big home run chase, throw them all back. Go ahead and broken bat single. In 2001, what happened in 2001? There's another great baseball team that didn't win the whole thing. That was the Mariners that came out, but why I mentioned the Mariners? Because there was a member in that, in that Mariners team in 2001 who retired just a few weeks ago, who we thought never would before he turned 80. <laughs> I'm going to play for the rest of his life. But Ichiro, Ichiro Suzuki, I think, had a big impact of changing modern baseball to making it an exciting game that was worldly universal. The best players from all over the world were on the best stage. And that guy was one of the best players in baseball. He wasn't from here. And uh, 2003 was the last year of a baseball curse. Before I'm not going to get into it, I'm going to run a past time just a little bit. 2006, um, what happened in 2006? It's not Major League. 
And nothing happened in Major Leagues. It was significant enough in my story in 2006 that it was World Baseball. First year of the World Baseball Classic. And uh, in Major League Baseball cities, it's not very popular because we have the highest stage of baseball already. But throughout the world, the baseball community throughout the world it is greatly recognized. And it's, a, it's, it's an, a, an honored tournament that they're going to try to do every four years or so. And they're just gonna, they would have one in, uh, I believe, uh, 09 and 13. They're due for another one. Um, in 2014, I want a little change in the baseball. We can't change the scoreboard. I can't change the lineup. I can't change the positions. But baseball did change a tiny little bit in 2014. They started allowing replay. And replay, it was uh, replay to the bases. Home runs, they allowed replay and home runs starting in 2008. But 14, they started allowing more replay. And they're going to continue to allow more replay. And may even have a robot umpire at home play at some point. But all they did here would still be the same, even if they did that. Even with replay, everything was still the same. They don't ruin the game. Uh, who knows? They said so. they said this ball here was going to ruin the game, and they went to 1920. They said the best end hitter was going to ruin so the game. When did they line it up the way it is today? As far as the ball, that's that's that's, that's myth and legend. The ball is oh, the same. No. The ball is the same. Oh, no, you sure? Is it rubbed up differently? Are you sure? Is it kept in a different climate and coarse field where it's higher and less altitude? There are there there are there are some there are theories on that. It's, 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 it's disputable. 2018, what happened last year of significance in baseball? I keep talking about global baseball. And I can't, I stayed away from Major League Baseball in particular to, to, to cover the whole broad spectrum. In 2018, there were 26 different countries represented in Major League Baseball. And I think it truly is the, the world sport. And because soccer isn't as popular in this country, I think baseball could take over. Because if baseball takes over, it becomes baseball dreaming. In 2019, where does that take us now? How's the game the same? How's the game, has the game changed? We mentioned the, the changes were small. Even when gloves were, were brought in, they didn't change a whole lot. They went to a, a style here by 1890, and it was the same as what we use today. But it didn't change the game. It didn't change anything the way it was set up. Um, the ball evolved a little bit. The clothing that we wore evolved a little bit. We went from these old-time hats into more modern style clothing. Catcher's mask developed into, but throughout the time it was it's not much different than the first one. This isn't much different than the first one. This bat, very similar to this bat. This hat, similar to this one. But the game is uh, still timeless. In 150 years of professional baseball, a lot has happened, but a lot has stayed the same. And a lot hasn't changed. And because baseball doesn't change, I think it can live on. It has continued to grow its uh, popularity in different ways throughout the past couple of decades. I am finished. I want to thank you all for listening. And uh, is there any questions anybody want to ask me anything about baseball history or baseball story? Was Cincinnati the first one to have a night game with the Lions? Yeah. Yes, yes. That's what I. That's what I thought. I, I up thought until that time, there were there were games that were played. They were they some of the lights that they had put up. They had tried some of the minor leagues and some of the other leagues. They were so shoddy, people were getting hit in the face with balls because it was so dark. There was one game in particular, the 19, uh, was it uh, late 1920s, they, had, they didn't have an outfield fence in the place where they were playing ball. The game was going on and on and on and on, and they didn't end it, and they wanted to crown a champion before it was over, and everybody parked their cars in the outfield and turned their headlights on and played with the headlights. So it was like, it, it, lights were coming. Um, before we came into the newer balls, were you allowed to keep the ball if they hit it out? No, you could not. It's a very good question. Back in the, the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, we're playing with one baseball. This baseball was the only one we brought to the ballpark. If this ball, if we, if we lose this ball, we got to go find it or the game's over. And they played with that one ball. The times when they started throwing more balls in, I'm not even sure what time period that would have started. I would have guessed around 1920 it would have been accessible to a lot more baseballs because you're hitting the harder ball the more it changed. And they had the fences. But it, it was. Up until a certain period of time, when grandstands started being built, by 1890, if it was hitting the stands in 1890, you got to keep it. And it's been like that ever since. Uh, bats is a different story, though. That guy wants his bat back. Sometimes he'll give you a different one, but he wants that bat back. His gamer. What else, guys? Can you put a hand go back up over here? Go ahead. Um, yeah, and Jackie Robertson played. Didn't they, like, boo him? They did. Like, they did. I mean, people were cruel all over the world. And in baseball, he was different. 
And people that were they were set in their way, it was just their game, the way they always, it was their perfect game. And when they let in Jackie Robinson and, and others, it was, uh, they didn't want him there and they wanted to keep their game. But then they realized, you know, we got to open up to everybody because how can we say this is the best game on earth that the best player can't even play? Now, at that point, they realized in the 40s and going in the 50s, and some teams struggled with getting, you know, uh, going with uh, uh, across the color barrier teams. It took them 15, 20 years in some cases. But then we realized that in the major stages, as I mentioned, 2018 with 26 different countries represented, it is the world's, it was the major leagues, it wasn't America's game. It was the world's game played in the United States. And in the major leagues, they wanted the best competition possible. So nobody can say Dave Bruce's stats aren't really true because he played in an inflated era with lesser degree ball players. And Ichiro's hits don't count in Japan because he played the league isn't as strong as the major. We hear those kind of arguments. A hit is a hit. <laughs> you like any other questions? There's big time. The longest, the longest hit. There's a story the other day that Dave Bruce hit with 587 feet. That's kind of hard to believe. That was definitely a win made. <laughs> um, when the longest really street car. <laughs> there was one that ended up. There was one that ended up on a streetcar. That ended up streetcar traveled, so the ball never hit the ground, and that baseball traveled some thousand miles or something. So it, it, it was, wouldn't hit that far, but it did travel that far. Um, there's all kinds of stories like that. There's a there was a very nice one in the 1870s when Cincinnati had lost its professional baseball teams, and they're clamoring to build a new one. They're still playing pro ball here, but it's other teams are coming in and playing visiting teams. There's a team from Boston that came in and played a team down in Ludlow, down in Kentucky, and they were playing next to the river. And one of the men on the Boston team, who was one of the guys that started the original 1869 Red Stockings, he had already moved to Boston by this time. He was one of the Wright brothers, baseball Wright brothers, and uh, he hit a ball in the Ohio River. This gentleman's question was, what happens to that ball? Well, that game was over because they couldn't they have another ball. And that's, there's a newspaper account, and that's a true story. That was a pro baseball play in Cincinnati. Was it Robinson that spoiled Blackwell's second consecutive a no hit game? I don't know for sure. Because <laughs> he, he was he was going for his second one. I remember I was coming home from caddying up at the golf course, and my, somebody picked me up and told me about that. And I can't remember exactly what that was, but he was going for a second straight note there, like Johnny Vandermeer. Well, it would be a, almost an incredible feat to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, you think about some of the, the baseball records and some of the, the legend. They're still trying to go after um, Maris's mark of sixty-one. You know, it's, it's still the cherished home run number. You know, if you can get 61, that's really, really special. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, numbers like that. It's uh, very interesting in baseball. I had a, a at Crosley Field when I was a kid. I went down there with my dad, and it was next to the stock market, the stock yards. And somehow they were loading a truck, and, and somehow a lot of the stock got away and was running through the streets of that. And so instead of watching the game, all the people would come. We were sitting at the second last row, so we saw it right away. But the people were leaving the stands and coming up and looking over across the, the back to see all the animals running. Oh, this is an incredible baseball story. <laughs> yeah. There was one they were going to, they had some elephant at one game early in the 1800s, and they were going to have it at the parade. And they took this elephant on tour in the city, and they took it and set some ballroom, and they were going to bring the elephant. And the elephant fell through the floor of the stage, and they couldn't get the elephant to opening day, and it was just a complete mess. When you think about some of the baseball stories, there was one in Chicago. They said they were cursed from 1908 to 2016. But in 1945 is when the curse began. It was the second curse began. The first one, they weren't really cursed, they were just unlucky. They didn't really have a name for it. But in 1945, there's an incident that happened with an animal that they considered themselves cursed for the rest of the time until they won. And there was the curse of Billy Goat. If you ever heard of the curse of Billy Goat, the curse of Billy Goat is pretty simple. If Gus Sines was a Cubs fan, and he's in the outfield and standing room seats, and he brings his goat. There's a mascot goat he called it. And sometimes he put a little tag around his neck and it said Cubs fan, Cubs mascot, and there was a joke in the outfield. Well, they're going to the World Series in 1908. And uh, uh, this happened in 1945. 1945, they had won the pennant the first time since the 20s, uh, the 30s, and 35 was the first time they won. But they hadn't been to the World Series since 1908, or hadn't won it since 1908. Anyhow, he brings his goat in. They said, we have, we're selling too many seats. We don't have room for your goat. It's, it's going to detract from the people that are attending the game. You're not allowed to bring your goat. He says, you can't let me bring my goat. And he uh, he, he cursed him, and he said, if, if the Cubs are never going to win a World Series ever again because you won't let my goat in the world. And since then, and they realized that after what went on 100-some years, they were bringing a goat into Wrigley 
you feel the same way you've been cursed. The other baseball curse is the curse of the Bayamino. That was the one that happened in 2003. It ended. And uh, that curse lasted 70 some years or something. And the curse of the Bayamino, Bayamino, that was Babe Ruth's nickname. And Babe Ruth was a pitcher for the Red Sox. And the Red Sox, the Red Sox owner wanted money for some kind of baseball activity outside of baseball. And he wouldn't have anything to do with it, but he needed money for it. So he sold one of his most popular players, was his pitcher Babe Ruth, to the New York Yankees, which was competition, and uh, in return to pay for his, you know, whatever he was doing on the side. And Babe Ruth went to the Yankees, and they changed the ball, and he started hitting the home runs, and everybody became a Ruth fan, and the Red Sox didn't win a World Series ever again, not until 2004. But in 2003, they're playing them for the Yankees. And I put 2003 in there, because I think that was the best series of all time. It was the American League Championship Series. And the Yankees won that series with a former Reds player named Aaron Boone when he hit a home run in the bottom of the, seven, bottom of the ninth inning in the seventh game. And it set the Yankees to beat the Red Sox one more time. But uh, it was such a great series. There were fights and everything else involved. It went all the way down to the end. And the next year, the Red Sox come back and beat them. And they finally ended that curse. There's another famous baseball curse that I think the truest baseball fans in this room may not have heard of. It happened over in Japan. Baseball is a fan of the game that has been taken over by the fans, by us, not the players. We, we tell the players how we want to do it. And uh, we are, the fans become so loyal and so passionate for their, toward it, and they're so broken up. They can remember where they were, where I was standing on my team won the pennant. I can remember where I was. I can remember, I can remember myself. I can remember what flavor of gum I chewed to dust in 2012, standing there in game three, watching them lose. You know, the Giants, and, you know, we all lose that series. That was a horrible moment in my life. <laughs> but think about over in Japan, there was a curse, the curse of, uh, they call it the curse of Colonel Sanders. There's a team called the Hanshin Tigers. The Hanshin Tigers, they had, hadn't won a World Series, in for, or a Japanese World Series in for a long time. And uh, they said it was going back to the time when it was a tradition, when this team would win a big game, a big series. They, they were, the fans would dress up like one of the players representing the team. So they would pick one of the players in the lineup, and that fan would have that, name, that player's number and his name on his shirt, and they painted it on there in paint, and they'd all line up, and they would jump in the river, cleanse themselves, and do a new season, and they'd jump back out, and, and it represented the team. Well, they, they, as the tradition went on and on, they kept trying to get somebody that looked like the player. And on that team that won that last championship, there was a player that was played for the United States. He was taller than the rest of them, and he was, didn't look like the rest of them played the Japanese team. And they didn't have anybody that looked like him in the fans to jump in the river. So one of the fans went to the local, at this time, fast food restaurants all over the world. And there was a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Hanshin. And they went over to Kentucky Fried Chicken and they picked Colonel Sanders' statue up and they put the number on it for the player that looked like Colonel Sanders, because he's the same color, threw it in the river. They, they weren't able to fish that out and they didn't, didn't win the World, Japanese World Series for a long time until Man, seven or eight years ago. That curse lasted for 30, 30, some 20, 30 years. They think they thought they were cursed. And, but that's how passionate baseball fans are. I know my mother is a Tigers fan, and my grandmother was a New Beams fan, and they would argue and fight when they played. I mean, they hated each other. Now, you can't believe they were even related. <laughs> they didn't even go to games together. No, my grandmother, when she lived in Cleveland, they'd go to Indians games, and my mom, she'd come and dress all her Tigers gear. And I always went along, too, because I was a baseball guy. And I liked both of those teams. They were great. But my team at that time, I had turned into a Reds fan by then. And, uh, but then, you know. Any more questions? Anything else going on? What do you got? Uh, when about the spitball declared in the uh, 1920. Good question. And I don't know the answer to everything. Don't think that, if I don't know, I'll tell you. I don't know what happened that time. I really don't know that. I do know that. That was 1920. That was the same year they changed the ball. And uh, why I didn't know that story in particular is there was a player, there was a, there was a spitball pitcher that pitched for the Chicago White Sox. And uh, there's a sports writer that told him, he says, hey, uh, <laughs> you ain't going to be able to throw that pitch next year. How are you going to get away with that? And you're already an old player now. I mean, you're already coming up with ways to get around because you've lost your fastball. And he had a great knuckleball, too. That's what he was known for. He, he was going to survive on that. But um, that's a good question. But they, and people are, do they still throw it? 2019, they evolved. Spitball. A spitball is you actually you get perspiration in your neck, you get a little bit, you put a little bit on the ball. So I get a little bit of grip on here. My fingers are a little bit more slippery. So when I grip it real tight, it's slippery. When I throw it, it slips a little bit more. It's a little, little more spin into it. Do you think it's still They outlawed it in 1920. 
Do they still do it in 2019, 100 years later? Absolutely. There's a player last year named Trevor Bauer, one of my favorite players in baseball. He says, to prove a point, there's one game I'm going to show you. I'm going to throw a spitball on I'm going to show you why it's different. He didn't tell anybody he was doing it until afterwards because he knows it's illegal. But he pointed back and said, after a spitball on this date, look at the records. And when they look at the fan graphs, they, they got all this information now they can read the degree and the foul of baseball. They know how it's going to twist and turn because they know everything about it. And that day, the rate of velocity of the spin was 400 times a second more for the first three innings. And he said, stop using that for third inning. Can you get away with that? How hard is that to detect? He didn't tell you that he did. He cheated. He got away with it. There's guys using quote bats. There's guys using um, all kinds of illegal substances to put things on the ball and to change things. And they get caught, they get thrown out of the game, and they try to keep it as, as proper as they possibly can. Have you guys ever had a cork bat? You know what a cork bat will do? <laughs> a bat is when you take a bat and you get a heavy bat. This is the way so many ounces. I take this bat here, and I'm going to take a drill. I'm going to drill a hole right down to the middle of it, as deep as I can drill. I'm going to keep a little, little piece of the wood to put it back on the top for a plug. And now what I have done, I'm 28 ounces of a bat or a 30 ounce bat, I decreased it four or five ounces, made it a little bit wider. So when I swing as fast as I can swing, the bat can actually travel through the strike zone just a little bit quicker. And it's got that, that when you hit a bat, it's so solid with that cork in there, put a cushion into it. It's like the rubber inside of a, a spring ball, one of them jumpy balls. It puts it in to give just a little more jump. The problem with the cork bat though, why they all get caught, is when you hit that ball as hard as you can, this bat that is now weaker breaks. And when it breaks, it breaks open. And the umpire standing there looking at it says, what is that? What is that? And if you're Chris Sable and you're playing for the Baltimore Orioles, you go, <laughs> and if you're a Cubs fan, and you do it right after Sammy Sosa did it, what they did, the Cubs fans would come with a ballpark with little pieces of cork stuck in their hands. Yeah. And they had a good start. They had a good baseball course. What's the significance of the Pitching mound being built up higher in that. Side. It went to overhand pitching because it, when, when it went to overhand pitching, uh, throwing from, from, from flat ground overhand, at, even at, at the ball, it, it, it was sinking too much, and, it, and you, you, they couldn't drop the strike zone so low for the batters to do it. And it, if you threw it upwards, it just it wasn't it wasn't getting that momentum. It was getting more of an arc rather than a straight pitch, and uh, it, it went more to pitching. You know, it, it's totally to to control an overhand pitch. And, uh, it, and it's stuck. It's uh, um, you get a pitcher that throws overhand on flat ground. He has to throw different because the ball can't be caught the same way. And some pitchers do that when they're coming back from injuries. It's good stuff. Good questions tonight. Some of got some big sponsors in here. If anybody has to leave, you're allowed to leave a little bit early. If not, take any more questions. I'll stay here all night and answer questions. So, any more? Who's the first pitcher to throw 100 miles an hour into a ball? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. You know what? I don't think anybody can come up with an answer for that. I know I can't. But I'll tell you why I can't. It's when did they start recording pitches? How, how, when did they start knowing how fast a pitch went? They had to have a device, <coughs> like, a, like, like, a, like a traffic uh, police officer would have, to, to, to trigger the speed. Now they do it more digitally. But when did that device show up? When did they make those? 60s? 70s? So there was no way of knowing. Right, they didn't know how fast somebody was throwing something. Right. They so believed there were people, rapid Robert Feller and Walter Johnson, they believed they threw over 100 mile an hour. Every bit of it. And there's plenty of others. And then Christy Matthewson was another one. That they, they, they said Sometimes they would, do, they would do contests where a pitcher would, he would out throw a motorcycle rider. A motorcycle rider would go flying by and the pitcher would you know, throw, or he'd out throw a horse, you know, a horse racing by just to see if he was faster. You know. But the question is, there's no way of knowing. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that. Um, the first time they did show up was probably right after the railroad gun showed up. I mean, they were, they were, they were throwing 100 right away. Um, I had went to Japan and watched a baseball game. And they, don't, they can't record a pitch mile per hour. Why can't they do that in Japan? They don't have miles per hour. They're not in the standard system. They're on metric. So they got kilometers an hour. How fast is kilometers an hour if you're throwing it at 100 mile an hour? Pretty fast. 161. <laughs> And there's a player that played for the Yokohama Bay Stars, who was from the United States originally, named Mark Kroon. And he threw 101 mile an hour. But they called him over in Japan, they called him Mr. 161. That was his name. And the only difference I see in the Japanese game compared to the American game is right here. Which I didn't even put on that board. One thing I didn't put on the scoreboard. How do you know the count? What's, what's the count in baseball? 
How many, what's the count? Well, wait, how many balls or strikes is there? How many balls or strikes? So if, I, if he had two balls and two strikes, what's the count? Two and two. He's two and two. If he had two balls and no strikes, what's the count? Two and zero. Two and zero is the count. Two balls, no strikes. Japanese, you got to think, different hemisphere. Everything Western Hemisphere, left and right, top to bottom. Everything in the Eastern Hemisphere, right to left, bottom to top. It's exactly the opposite in every way you can think about it. And they do balls and strikes. The only thing in Japanese baseball is different that I've seen is they flip the count. Instead of doing a 2-0 count, two balls and no strikes, it's an 0-2 count. Because it's zero, ball, zero strikes, no balls, two balls. A little confusing, but that's the only thing that I've noticed. All right, let's wrap it up. You guys are great. Thank you for coming out. Yeah.